Ladies and gentlemen, it's another episode of Prototype. We are on to number 15. This one is called Warp Field Stabilized, and it's not because it's related to the Didact, which is of course the unit that says that when you train it. It's because it's related to the Protoss macro model, the model in which the Protoss build stuff and train units and essentially create their base. So today we're gonna to be talking about our problems with the current model that I see in terms of the gameplay within Cosmonarchy Brood War. And I'm gonna break down the proposed revised model. It's simpler than I thought it would end up being, but I think that's actually a feature as opposed to a bug, so to speak. And we'll be talking a bit about some of the things that are not set in stone just yet about this new model and some things that are still yet to be solved or yet to be decided. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the stuff is kind of already in a good spot conceptually, and I'm pleased enough with the progress that I am able to talk about it publicly in a very formal way. So let's talk about the current model. For those who are not in the know, Cosmonarchy Brood War, this massive overhaul of StarCraft I, adds a ton of new units and structures, and for the Protoss in particular, we went through a couple different revisions for how they would work. Initially, they worked kind of like they did in the OG StarCraft I days, where just like all the other races, you build certain structures so you can unlock a certain other structures. Like the Stargate was unlocked by the Cybernetics Corps. That's very familiar to people. Although, I admit, I had to double check my thinking on that while I was saying it, because it has been a long time since I've actually played StarCraft I. Now, that being said, the other stuff to note is that we eventually moved away from requirements for individual structures, uh, but instead had, you know, you build the Cenotaph, as it was then eventually called, instead of the Cybernetics Core, and that still unlocks certain units. Uh, instead of unlocking the Dracodin, our name for the Dragoon, it unlocked two new units, the Hierophant and the Legionnaire. Although there was a brief phase as well where each individual unit needed its own structure that you built. So like the Stargate trained the Gladius and the Exemplar, but they needed a different structure each. And this ended up being very expensive and kind of dumb with your base layout if you wanted to have a lot of units, but it did at least improve things in general where the Protoss did feel very different than the other races. And also it meant that if you were trying to attack Protoss, you could kind of siege individual structures to, you know, cut into what kinds of units they could actually train. But it was still a little bit clunky and not really our forte. Now we arrive at the modern model. I'm sure there's a couple of small revisions in there. I'm skimming over here. But when we think about the modern model of Cosmonarchy Brood War Protoss, we think about having no tech requirements whatsoever for units or structures, and instead you balance them around resource costs. This model has served us acceptably so far, but it does yield some significant issues that have come to light, particularly as we, the project has received more attention due to the tournaments, but it was already stuff that we were aware of going into Ascension, so now we're thinking about how we can resolve these problems, but let's identify them. The fact that your tech progression is so avant-garde it can be anything you want you know you can kind of just pick and choose it's almost like a buffet style uh, it does yield some issues both for the player you're playing against and for you yourself as the protoss player uh, most notably there is the information burden where not only does your opponent not necessarily know every single unit in the game especially when they first start out um, they don't really have any intuition as to what you might be going because you could be going many different things at many different times and that might be fine in general when you're in the mid game and you have a lot of bases and you've already achieved some level of tech like the other races have to. But in general, especially in the early game, before we slowed down the pacing of the game and made it so that, you know, time to kill was a bit higher and the economic model scaled up a bit slower. We were seeing a lot of volatility with Protoss where they might go for rogue galleries first, or indeed, as Mesk famously did in a team game, uh, you might go Sanctum of Sorrow first, uh, which is pretty amusing since you get two units out of there and they're very specialists. But in team games, you might be able to do something crazy like a very greedy tech rush that gives you powerful individual units. And that's kind of interesting from a power fantasy standpoint. And in fact, it was kind of the point of the revision initially. And so it's less so an unintended consequence that you can do pretty much anything. And more so, you know, particularly in team games as we get to, those particular games ended up being really weird and strange and either you know, it would fall flat because of player skill or it would be really good, maybe also because of player skill. Uh, either way, in this particular case, even though it wasn't a mistake and it wasn't like a, an edge case or something, it was actually the intentional sort of idea behind the model of make Protoss feel so different from all the other races that they can build anything at any time, assuming they have the money. Um, 
it, it, we still were able to naturally, I think, or maybe not naturally, but we were able to gate the power of the Protoss by that money and the, the monetary cost of things. And as a result, they didn't feel, they don't feel unwinnable when you play against them. Uh, although I'm sure there's going to be some very specific strategies that people could try to develop if they end up, you know, quote unquote, maining Protoss for a while. Uh, for example, in the forthcoming Ascension 3, the Shambler will be playing as Protoss. So it would not surprise me one bit if he goes super ham on trying to find these sort of wacky builds that allow him to it, take advantage of the fact that Protoss can do so much. And I think once you cross that information burden, both as the Protoss player and the player playing against Protoss or with Protoss in team games, there are some really compelling strategies you can make, but it doesn't really change the fact that there is a huge amount of issues learning that information. And even if you just sort of accept that, okay, Cosmonarchy Brood War, that one race is not going to be particularly accessible, and maybe that's not really the end of the world, it still is an obvious, I would say, flaw in the design that it does take so many games more for Protoss to intuit and build an intuition of what exactly they're capable of, either with you controlling them or with anybody else. This also does have an in-game effect, even among experienced players, in choice paralysis. There's something elegant, in a way, about being restricted to certain tiers of tech or certain things of tech, where you know that if you want access to a certain tool to deal with a certain problem that fits well with your existing composition, you know how to get there. And it's fairly specific, granular, you could say, does require you to maybe add some add-ons or, you know, put down some different tech in terms of your structures for Zerg and all of that stuff. For Protoss, they don't really have that to the same degree. And in fact, if they ever want to try and specialize their army, okay, yeah, they can do that just fine. But if they want to add a lot of production for the same thing, well, they better hope that that one structure has everything they need for a good while, because a lot of their structures end up being fairly single purpose or specific in terms of the one situation that they're in right now calls for a tool that does come from the structure, but maybe doesn't necessarily call for the, the other tools that are enabled by that structure. A key example of this would be if you really don't need legionnaires because you're dealing with an air threat, but you want to use hierophants, you still need to construct cenotaphs. And okay, maybe you can get away with just a couple of, of cenotaphs, but it might be better in a way if you could specifically upgrade your gateways in some capacity in order to train hierophants or maybe train them both, but that way you're still using old infrastructure to do that and augmenting them a little bit differently, particularly with your reliance on pylons for power fields. And generally speaking, on top of all of that, it does feel like there's only a few cases, at least with the current metagame that's developed between our player base, that the true essence of what it means to be Protoss, where you kind of shirk these tech requirements and just sort of brush them off and say, no, we're, we're better than that. Most of the time that doesn't yet happen in the current metagame. And that might not really be resolved by the revision, revision of the model, but it might be resolved by revising the model, thus making it more elegant and understandable and easier to intuit, thus allowing players to explore you know, paradoxically, by putting a couple of constraints on them here and there, it might allow them to explore in a more, you know, understandable and comfortable way, I guess, for lack of a better term. I mean, we're all, we've all been familiar with the idea that, like, just creatively, you might have a million things you could do, and you have to narrow that down to one thing or a couple of things that you want to pick from. And, you know, the, the grocery store analogy comes to mind where maybe you're just trying to buy a product, but there's 20 options. Well... Are you really going to look at every single one of them? Maybe. Some people will. But a lot of people won't. A lot of people will just pick whatever is the least bad option they can immediately find with the first five minutes. And it, particularly if you're in the middle of a game, that time is a lot less than five minutes, right? That's uh, m more like five seconds you need to make a decision about what to build. And a lot of people are just going to stick with what they already know or what they already have. And that will generally mean that the diversity, if you want to use that term, the variety, I would say, a less charged term, for what your builds are going to be, that's going to be taking a hit as a result of this choice paralysis. And that's probably the biggest problem that I want to resolve. And we are also in the in progress of that. We are, in theory, opening up more opportunities for that thematic to be felt on a racial level and also for that information burden to be resolved a little bit insofar as it's more like the other races in terms of having tech progression to begin with instead of sort of having tech progression at the beginning and then who knows what happens when people start floating a bunch of money and stuff. So let's move on to breaking down the revised model. This is the proposal. We've already started implementing this on a technical level and we already have a couple of these uh, features implemented in that sense. You can actually see in the thing that I used for our wallpaper here, our screenshot, our image, we actually see pylons channeling the structures, although they're not really channeling, it's just 
you can see the order line, so maybe it looks like they're channeling. So, the Protoss macro revision is such that the workers no longer actually warp in structures. Instead, they transform into pylons in what's called dedication. They dedicate into a pylon. This is a one-way transformation. Of course, if you cancel the pylon, you'll get your worker back. However, the costs are still there. So not only do you pay for the worker, but you pay for the pylon, and there will be some increased mineral and time costs as a result of this, most likely. At the very least, time costs, maybe not mineral costs, we'll see. Pylons are able to warp in structures now as opposed to workers, and these structures are based on the pylon's tier level. So if you have a tier two structure, you have to have at least a tier two pylon in order to warp it in. However, I'm not 100% yet sure that the tier two pylon will need to power the tier two structure, mostly because of a technical limitation where I'm actually not sure if we can prohibit this placement and all that stuff. So that's another thing that's gonna be yet to set in stone. I'll cover that again later on when we're in that section of the podcast. The other thing that of course pylons can do is upgrade into the next tier of pylon. They, this is also called a dedication. They dedicate into another tier. And the other thing that you can think of this as is kind of like building morphs, but there is no Zerg regression, unlike the Zerg case. So instead of, you know, regressing from Circuit into Kagrant or whatever, the tier two pylon is just destroyed. And then you have to replace it with a tier one pylon that then, you know, dedicates back into a tier two pylon. The st all structures, in, you know, besides pylons, of course, including the Nexus even, will require power for the initial warp. We hope to also make this a truism for the aquifer as well, but that's another tech requirement that we have to sort of solve as far as fixing that internally, since there's no check for that right now. If there is no power, rather than the structure being completely depowered, it will lose 50% efficiency, which means it will be training units half as quickly or attacking half as fast or something to that effect. Right now, I am planning on for them to lose all shield regeneration, but not necessarily degenerate shields the way that uh, flash shielding works, but in reverse. Um, that is something that is also subject to change potentially, but I'd like to see that in action. Really, we have to see how common and impactful it really is for pylons to be sniped to begin with. And again, uh, the pylons can warp structures in anywhere with allied power. There is no range limitation on that because you're kind of limiting range in a sense by having you know, power to begin with. The power fields themselves allow this and facilitate this power. The pylons themselves do not channel to uh, create the structure at all. So instead it's similar to the scribe where, I mean, the scribe needs to be at the location in order to warp the structure in, but besides that, they can warp in as many as they want and then leave. The pylon can do the same thing, but obviously needs to be created by a scribe to begin with or an, uh, an artisan, right? I'm not yet sure whether the artisan will work in a context of like, you know, it'll probably turn into a higher tier pylon or something in, as a baseline. Like maybe it'll turn into a tier three pylon instead of a tier one pylon. We're planning on there to be four tiers of pylons because there are currently four tiers of structure that we have mapped out. Uh, but that is something that I'm not yet sure about exactly either. These are, this is now where we get into things about like what exactly is going to change or what have you. But as far as the initial explanation of the, the macro revision and what it means, it means that you still need to send a worker to an expansion location to turn into a pylon, thus creating a power field, thus allowing you to build an Nexus there, or indeed a crucible when the, you know, whatever their structure is that uh, is a, a town center uh, copy in that sense, right? A, a discount town center or a town center with additional doohickeys associated with it. And in that context, you know, crucibles could even potentially turn into a higher tier of pylon, although they obviously are much bigger than the current pylon. So I'm not really sure how that would work out exactly. Since right now, crucibles are power fields, that will probably change with this as well. I do really like the idea of tiered structures not being able to be placed anywhere other than higher tier pylons, because I think that that would elevate the SimCity and elevate the like necessity of planning your base out. And that's something that Protoss specifically do quite a bit anyway with their pylons, but something that could be maximized at the later tiers and something that really wouldn't be the end of the world if you need to upgrade a couple more pylons because yeah, okay, this costs are gonna be somewhat significant, especially in the early game, but just like the current model, where essentially the more production structures you build, the more cost you're paying, like the more of a premium you're paying. Like you think about the, uh, I did some breakdown a while ago where if you wanted to build a ton of, you know, I think it was prostration stages or something for higher tier Templar units, you contrast that with the higher tier bio units for Terran requiring a captaincy. Well, there's an initial cost of dropping, you know, the Atlas to begin with. And then there's the cost of each structure of the captaincy. But after a certain point, it becomes a lot more cost efficient for Terran because they're 
individual production structures cost less. It's just that they have a upfront cost of scaling into the next tier. Meanwhile, the Protoss have higher individual costs, but they can access them maybe quicker. They can almost use this to use terminology coined by Veek anyway, as far as I'm aware. They can peak their tech tree and peak into the next tier by specializing immediately into one structure and then sitting on that one structure for a while, as opposed to building a lot of the same structure. Uh, now, Protoss are going to have three different ways as a result of augmenting their tech power or their level of power in general for military. They can either build more of the same production structure that they already have. They can upgrade their pylons. They can dedicate their pylons, which will unlock new units at those same production structures. Or they can use higher tier pylons to warp in higher tier production structures. So if we use the gateway versus grand library example to try to calcify this, you can imagine I have two gateways and a tier two pylon, or a tier one pylon, rather. I can upgrade my pylon into tier two, and that will unlock Hierophants and Legionnaires from my gateway. I can build more gateways so I can have access to more production queues of Zealots, Dracodons, and Ecclesiasts. Or I can do the dedication of my tier two pylon and then warp in a grand library instead of a gateway. And either one of those, all three of those are fair game in terms of what you want to do with your money. You can probably do them relatively equivalently. I mean, obviously it's cheaper to build just the upgraded pylon uh, than it is to build the upgraded pylon and then build more uh, production structures, uh, but you know, Hierophants and Legionnaires, maybe they cost a little bit more later on or something as a result of this, right? There's probably a lot of balance changes that are going to happen as a result of this model being a, a thing. Once we hit the tier three situation where we are starting to deal with, you know, even more powerful units and structures, um, this is a case where I have a feeling that certain structures won't be useful for tier three or maybe for tier four. Like maybe there is going to be a unit that's unlocked from the gateway by tier three, uh, but there is a potential for certainly like infinite scaling for like the mid game structures, right? So maybe the grand library gets, uh, you know, some units unlocked by tier four. Uh, it was asked earlier in the general discussion of CMBW's chat channel in our discord server, which you can join by a link in the description below whether or not there would be a significant number of structures cut. And I can tell you pretty confidently that for Protoss, they're probably just going to have, you know, gateway, ardent authority because it's big and, and you know, in that context, maybe automaton register instead on it, something bigger than the lattice, or maybe I'll, you know, get a, a lattice remodel done eventually that's bigger. Uh, and then Stargate, and that will be your production structure for tier one. And I'm not actually sure that you'll get a production, a new production structure each time at each tech. Like you might get Rogue Gallery for tier two Templar and Grand Library turns into a tier three thing. Uh, you could imagine the uh, Rogue Gallery then would also get the Sanctum of Sorrow units or maybe even the Prostration Stage units. Meanwhile, the Grand Library itself would probably ac have access to all of its units and then the Ancestral Archives. And again, at that point, you have to ask yourself, what would be the tier three unit trainable by the gateway if there even was going to be one? Maybe it's the Herald and that turns into a powerhouse unit or something to that effect. Let's talk a little bit more as well about, you know, how the other branches would turn out. I mean, given the fact that we only really, realistically speaking, we're talking about having like Ardent Authority and Synthetic Synod for robotics. That means that the Ardent Authority would be I don't know, there's 10 units available at the uh, early stages of the tiers. I guess maybe Synthetic Synod would be a tier three structure and it would get the Analog and maybe the Architect or something. And then the Servitor, Positron, and a Cantor would be the tier two units unlocked from the tier two pylon when you dedicate it around an Automaton Register, which would otherwise be able to train the initial three or five units or something. You know, this is all something that I'm thinking about. You know, do we have a... a do we have a uh, in-between tier or something so that you dedicate your pylon either into a, you know, tier 1.5 pylon or a tier two pylon? And the tier two pylon does the 1.5 thing, but the 1.5 thing is faster for a tempo play. I'm not 100% sure if that would work out. That was kind of like what we had a while ago for Zerg, where they could either go into 2.5 or three and they would make the decision for either tempo or, you know, investment into the future. And I wasn't really a super big fan of how that worked because it was such a very significant decision and it was still a very steep cost. Whereas if the 1.5 stuff is a lower cost and it's on an individual regional basis for the pylons, obviously only powering structures nearby, that might actually be a reason to do that where even after you have access to tier two structures, you might still put 1.5s around gateways and automaton registers for the sake of being able to say, oh, I have access to the 1.5 units while, you know, meanwhile, 
uh, you don't need that for the tier two stuff like the Grand Library or Rogue Gallery or whatever it doesn't even accept that. So that's not even how you get it. Maybe that does make some sense, right? So again, thinking about the things that are not yet set in stone, that's definitely one of them. AI handling is another thing. Like in general, this um, revision is actually a lot simpler than I expected it to be. That's mainly because I need a sort of path in my head for like how we're going to improve the AI, how we're going to allow AI to even use this. There's some technical limitations on that. And Vic has been giving me some advice for what, you know, things to uh, try to pursue in that front. And broadly speaking, I feel like it's definitely a possibility, but uh, we have to figure that out. It's kind of a black box as far as like how to handle that goes. I mean, there's a couple of leads that I have for at least immediate progress, but, and, and to begin with for players, this isn't even fully operational. I mean, the audio visuals definitely need some work and there's actually a, currently a bug with shield regeneration, but uh, nothing significant, realistically speaking, like you can do this as a player. We could technically push this to pre-release right now. It's just, it would be very jank looking. And obviously AI are totally broken with it. So we wouldn't want to push it for now. That being said, um, the aquifer and uh, general handling for gas is also something that I'm not, you know, it's not set in stone. My current thinking was that maybe you'd have a tier two and a tier three gas structure, just like the uh, Terrans do with the reservoir and the well bore. And they would just be warped in by different pylons, or, you know, you could technically warp in the tier two one from a tier three pylon if you wanted to. Uh, that is in, admittedly not very asymmetric. If we wanted to have each race have a completely different manner of upgrading their gas, the problem is, if I'm just going to give pylons auras, you know, that's another thing that's not yet decided. Do we get, you know, the tier two pylon also acts as like a shield battery or something. The tier three pylon acts as a crucible and the tier three pile, uh, tier four pylon maybe acts as something else uh, that's not yet been de developed. You could maybe make the argument that that could work. It's just, again, if, if we do fragment these costs off and then you have the aquifer maybe being uh, gated by a tier two, uh, and then tier three increases the yield and then tier four increases the yield even further. Or maybe there's only one way to increase the yield that that maybe that could work just fine. It's just we would have to standardize that as a mechanic. I wouldn't want auras only affecting, you know, one unit in one way. And that's kind of how it feels for the context of gas. But maybe it just has to be this one way, like specific thing that it interacts with. You know, I, StarCraft 2 has a lot of examples like this and a lot of RTSs do in general where this one ability has one exception or one behavior that it does for this one thing, or it's only useful for this one thing. And maybe that's all the, the only useful thing could technically be true in CMBW as well, no matter what, if it's only useful in terms of how the meta develops it, but I would still in theory want it to affect multiple things. So maybe the tier three pylon works in the context of, it's kind of like a crucible, it increases structure efficiency, and we just make it so that it adds one to the gas yield for the aquifer, but also increases, you know, efficiency elsewhere. So there's a reason to build it in a multitude of places. We would just, again, have to be careful about being able to give Protoss access to that super early. And maybe that's why it should be the tier four pylon instead, where you get the, the gas structure at the tier two pylon, which is still something that you can access faster. So the aquifer would still cost more than the reservoir or the, uh, excisant but the other thing to consider is you know if the tier four pylon is faster to rush than the tier three tech structure is for terran and zerg you might still be in a situation where protoss can choose to do that and maybe they have some sort of imbalance i don't think it would show up at this level of skill but still something to keep in mind might be tricky to balance that's my only significant gripe with this as far as like i'm not sure exactly if the aura is the way to go however if you're already going to have tier one aura being hey, check out my the fact that I power your structures at all. And tier two aura is something like, you know, I don't know, shield boost or something, you know, whatever the case may be. Maybe uh, shield armor is increased specifically uh, while you're around this pylon. So you get reinforced in that sense. Um, that could be interesting <clears throat> for defenses and could be compelling in a variety of ways. So I want to say that that's probably a fairly uh, reasonable idea if each one of the tiered pylons actually has a unique aura. I don't know that the auras themselves would replicate. I would they would you also get the tier 2 aura when you build a tier 3 dedicated pylon? If I decide not to do that, what you might end up seeing is players I'd obviously have a variety of different levels of dedication for their pylons. So maybe that could actually be interesting even though in theory it would mean that it's just it's not like a net upgrade uh for each pylon to be different. But I still think that would be pretty cool. And really good Protoss players would actually start to um, set up their base 
for the late game in the early game. And if you're getting that good at the pre-planning phase and stuff, that would be really awesome, I think. There's a couple other things that I'm not yet decided on. I think the uh, the placement size, right, is currently a two by one, so it's uh, wider than it is tall. It's also a little problematic for build abilities purposes. Like it actually, it's not a huge deal, but on, on maps, I constantly have to think, oh, Protoss can still put a pile on here. So maybe they could then build something in an area that I'm not intending or whatever. I mean, technically you can only build a pile on there, so it's not really that big of a deal. But in theory, it might be unintended, unintentional for you to build anything there. And maybe it gives you like good scouting intel when it's supposed to be unbuildable, uh, broadly speaking. And I wouldn't want that to be the case. So I have to think about like how to wrangle that or whatever. I think that will also go away because this will probably end up re, you know, I'm not sure that we'll have the old model back. Like I told Fugudo in the chat, I actually want there to be a, uh, a new model because we need obviously to have different upgrades for it and stuff. So that'll be a, a big art task, if you will, to have all the different tiers of upgrade. And that's pretty much it as far as the, uh, the warp field stabilized stuff is concerned, right? That That's the warp matrix, the new revision that we're planning. Um, I'm sure there's going to be loads of attempted cheese where you can technically put a scribe anywhere and turn them into a pylon and then try to warp structures in from afar or using that very pylon. But And also considering that they still have 50% efficiency when the pylon is gone. But because you have to consume your scribe and then go into, you know, do I if I ever lose power, I have to think about like where to put the the next scribe how do i get more workers there or whatever um i feel like that kind of play is unlikely to show up at any point uh and be super successful unless the other person really just doesn't scout so i think that's pretty much everything that i wanted to cover here i will yet again be considering the very specifics once we get the uh bare implementations done for for example ai um just so that they can at least build using tier one pylons and at the same time, I'll figure out other things like obviously the gas handling and how the auras are going to work and how many different tiers are there going to be. Like we plan four tiers, but if there's going to be a 0.5, I mean, we would want to figure out like, is that a, an exception? Does it just go to, does it always go to 0.5 before you can go to two? Like that's a little bit awkward, but I mean, we could make it work. It's just like, do you want that? Or do you want to be able to go straight into tier two and skip that? Uh, that should also be, I think, a valid option in theory, but maybe I'll think something differently if I consider it a little bit longer. So this is my first time presenting this kind of concept in a very organized manner, and hopefully it's cogent enough that you guys can engage with the idea and consider what might happen as a result of these changes. I'm certainly interested in feedback on it, but at this point, we're, we are pulling the trigger on it. So it's a question of if you don't like something about it or you do like something about it knowing what that is and why is actually pretty useful so of course leave some comments below or start some conversations over on the discord server either one works for me and now i will take a moment to consider my options for what we're going to talk about next but i'm pretty sure it's just going to be coffee questions yeah let's do some coffee questions we actually got a lot today so that most of this podcast might end up being uh answering those which i i am not shy about i am not unhappy about course shout out to the people who are joining us in this journey of creating great work and uh great games and great gaming experiences these people are sending us some moolah at regular intervals if you want to do the same we're gonna go and vic7 that's ko fi.com slash chrono go vic7 check it out link in the description all right let's talk about mirian's question first since he was the first person to submit i'm doing these in order of submission can you talk about how music can characterize a faction? And the answer, of course, is yes. He, he gives some concrete examples. Uh, Zerg soundtrack. Uh, I'm assuming he's talking about Brood War for all this. Zerg soundtrack is, uh, you know, Alien Apocalypse. And uh, Terran soundtrack is something a little bit um, from the from the past in, in the... Uh, let, me, let me get this wording exactly correct here. Uh, invokes an older concept in a futuristic setting. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I actually feel like I, I recently made a change to remove the Brood War uh, UED victory or whatever uh, soundtrack from the Terran uh, OST because it just doesn't do it for me. It actually isn't very consistent with the other tracks. And there are like it's actually uh, upon listening to it again, when you just listen to it and you're not focusing in on whatever happens to pop through while you're playing the game. 
it's a little bit more similar than I initially had expected it to be, but it turns into this very like anthem esque, you know, military pride or whatever. And, and that's fine for the UED. And if the UED got a bunch of stuff and they had like, you know, custom playlist support, like we do in CMBW, maybe they could have done something like that for brood wars campaign, but instead they ended up having this very like clashing thing. And that's to say nothing of the fact that you always get that one after the first Terran song, because instead of create adding a, a fourth WAV file to the music, they added the Brood War song to the end of the first track because they had to make sure they only had three tracks, I guess. I don't know. Like this, the engine can support up to like 99, I think, or, or at least nine. I don't remember how many it can support. It's, it's something, you know, there's a lot of tracks that you can put in there by default without any modding. You can just add the, add the music. You don't need to do any reverse engineering to make it work. So I don't know what the hell's going on there. How can music characterize a faction? Um, well, for sure, there's like lay motifs and motifs. And like, if you look into the, the way that these work or what this musical terminology is, uh, you can you pretty quickly piece together what I'm talking about, where you have these iconic sounds that end up being very specifically relevant to how the, the whole thing is going to play out, right? It's you know, what does this music say about it, right? If you look at the recent uh, Dune film by Denis Villeneuve, you can, uh, directed by Denis Villeneuve, obviously by many people, <laughs> um, there's a lot of musical sort of theater uh, happening there where you have a whole suite of music for one character. And then you'll have a whole suite of music or like very specific instruments that maybe are invoked later on but they're in a different arrangement or they're in the context of having different instruments and so like maybe the one character has a couple of instruments that are unique to him but the faction that he belongs to is you know has other instruments that they use and some of the same instruments that they use so there's an overlap there so that that shows you that he belongs to that faction but stands out in some specific way or is important enough to warrant something like this there's a lot of communication there Meanwhile, you switch over to like the Harkonnen side, which is the the bad guys, for lack of a better term, in that in that particular book uh, or in that particular uh, film. What you'll notice is that they have very different instrumentation. Now, the film does kind of go the tried and true method of just using really bassy vocals and uh, wacky stuff going on all the time with uh, regards to the the instrumentation there for the Harkonnens. Like, I won't say it's not stereotypical. And I also won't say it's turbo generic, but it kind of shows the job. It illustrates the concept. Uh, and then if you go over to the um, the general approach of how they like they did certain other soldiers there, there's a military I'm blanking on the name right now, but uh, they have a, a, like an elite guard of the emperor and a Sardaukar, that's what they are. And, and so like they have their own sort of very throaty vocals that they have. It's very, very different. Uh, it does sound pretty cool if you're into that sort of thing. And I certainly am. And that's also very in a stark contrast to everything else. So I kind of think about music in the same way that I think about visual art in the context of graphics for a game, right? You want to make it seem like all of this stuff coexists in the same setting, but you also want to make it seem like it's very different, like different enough within the setting to still be part of the same product. So not different enough that it's too far, but different enough that they feel distinct and, and unique. And treading that line with music is actually maybe a little bit easier than it is with visual art. Because with visual art, there's like a style that informs a lot of everything. Um, where, yeah, you're going to do pixel art. Or, yeah, you're going to do, you know, 3D models rendered into sprites like Brood War, you know. Meanwhile, for music, as long as you're not doing like chiptune stuff or whatever, like if you're using conventional instrumentation concepts like you know some of them might use an orchestra some of them might use you know you could even use some synth um in addition to you know like in the same product as an orchestra but the point is like as long as it's full range of motion it's it's sort of like if you have an, a palette for your game like a, a restricted palette and then you go to R full rgb it's like full rgb but for audio right if you're using the full range that we accept instead of using you know stuff that is from the, an era where sound cards had a limited number of things that they could do. That's sort of what I'm talking about when it comes to music. And so you, you first want to establish what kinds of things are you doing? What is the breadth of what you're going to be attempting? And for something like Cosmonarchy Brood War, we're thinking about Terran Zerg and Protoss. We're thinking about, I mean, by default, the Protoss music is actually very limited in terms of notes. There are some movements within the pieces, but for the most part, it's actually just a bunch of synths and sort of like ambience. And that's not necessarily a slight against that choice. 
Um, some of it is actually kind of evocative of Warcraft 2 music, funnily enough. Uh, but generally speaking, you'd look at the way that the music is arranged and it's mostly ambient stuff, right? It's not necessarily a whole lot of anything else. And maybe that's fine because the Protoss are meant to be like common battle and, you know, they're not necessarily put off and, and you know, they act decisively, but they are calm about their decisions. Again, that's not really reflected in the campaign, but maybe you can say that that reflects back their play style where they have, you know, they don't necessarily need to build the million units that Zerg do and their units are individually durable, more durable, not just than Zerg, but also than Terran. And they have like great power in terms of their tech and all this other stuff. I got, I'm thinking of Starcraft one here as opposed to CMW. Um, like that, that, you know, okay, that makes sense. Uh, these things are more true in CMW than they were in Starcraft one, but you know, I'm restricting my level of analysis of the music to Starcraft one, since that's the original version of, uh, where the music was made for, right? We didn't make the, you know, any, any new music for in game. We only have the title stuff that, uh, Bailethal made. So with that established, the one thing I would say is what you probably want to do with your art and with your music for a faction or a race is you want in whatever way that they're being proposed, like if they're being presented as a uniform faction for whatever reason, like in Melee, your soundtrack should probably just be the... Like, it doesn't need to be really zoomed in in high resolution, right? This is a term that I would use, even though it's weird to say that about music or audio in general. You don't necessarily need it to be, I'm going to get super specific and talk about this one faction or this, I'm going to make a, a soundtrack for this one unit. Like, that's not what we have to do. We're talking about the race as a whole. We're talking about, you know, the default faction, the melee faction, whatever. We're talking about the general gist of what they are. We're going to give you sort of like, this broad overview of what this race is. If you want to do that through music, you certainly can. And that's probably how I would go about it for melee music in general. The other thing that I had concepts for was again, going back to the lay motif idea where there's certain instruments or sounds that are indicative, evocative, tied to the concepts of certain characters or units or races or whatever. I would have that for all of my races in say Cosmonarchy Retail. And say you're playing as Ansifi and you've got your own music playing. And then you engage Keltar and their war drums start playing at a maybe a lower level initially, but they start playing to join the arrangement that you have. So basically we would have one very long movement that would probably stretch across like an hour or something. And at very, so at various points, you know, you'd have your own Ansifi music, right? That would be the, the baseline, so to speak, right? You'd always have your Ansifi music. And then when the Keltar show up, cause you're fighting them, the war drums start hitting. And then when you're allied with, say, Ember Seat, well, the Ember Seat, the leitmotifs are going to be there, but to a lower degree on a lower level because they're your ally. They're not you. So you'd still be, have the dominant mix of Ansifi. They join the fight with the Keltar. Maybe their music picks up a little bit and then it sort of smooths out and some of their other instrumentation fades away. And on a technical level, this is a challenge. But from a conceptual standpoint, it seems like having the interactivity dictate how involved certain musical elements are is actually a really big deal. It's just not something that I've seen attempted before. You kind of have the idea in, in pretty much any action game that you control one character in where I'm going to attack. I'm, I'm playing God of War. I'm playing as Kratos. And I'm going to attack and then I'm in combat and then I'm exploring. And so like, you know, that dichotomy of like the music fading out or transitioning off or, you know, in the, in the really bad new Doom games, um, when you're in combat, there's always like a stinger that transitions you out of it. And it's usually very jarring if you're paying attention to it. And you're not really in engaged by the audio and the soundscape of that game anyway, which is why demons that are towering above you can sneak up on you because like there's just no sound mixing whatsoever. It's really bad for readability in general. Uh, but broadly speaking, you know, at the end of combat, you're always going to have a transition into something else. We want that transition to be a little bit more organic. And, you know, yeah, maybe... The, maybe the movement is always a little bit more on the ambient side. Maybe the movement is always the, the arrangement of the music and the way that it flows. Maybe the tempo is always a little bit more on the slow side. And instead of worrying about tempo setting the feeling and the vibe of, oh my God, I'm in combat. We would instead have tension built by the number of instruments or the dominance of those instruments. If you're losing to Keltar, if Keltar units are on top of your production structures, maybe their structures or their their um, lay motifs, their music, their instruments, maybe they overpower the Ansifi instrumentation because you are, you know, now being sort of uh, attacked by them very heavily, and now you're in danger, and you can tell because the war drums are kicking on to gear, and and that would also be playing for you know replays, casters, you know, uh, live cast or whatever, like 
that tells a story in and of itself, right? So it's not just characterizing the faction through the actual instruments, but it's also telling the story of the game, of the match that's actually occurring, of the battle that's occurring, the skirmish that's occurring. You want to use like real world immersive uh, terminology. Um, I think that can really work out quite well. So I guess I didn't really answer exactly how music can characterize a faction because obviously I talked about like, I did talk a little bit about that with the Protoss example, but instead I was talking about like technically how I might implement music and stuff. I'm sure that's interesting, but it's also not what the question was. So to reiterate or to go back and refocus, uh, I think music, generally speaking, in an RTS has to be a little bit more on the ambient side and a little bit less on the attention grabbing side. Somehow the Terran music, even though it's quite noisy, is kind of ambient. Like maybe that's just because we grew up with it and so we, we kind of tune it out, or tune out the noisier parts of it. Or, or, or maybe it's actually because Blizzard found a way with their music to be noisy enough to potentially be attention grabbing, but flowy and melodic enough to not be annoying about it. Uh, the Zerg music, I've actually heard that people don't like the Zerg music the most because it is a little bit more, it's got weird time signatures and it does sometimes call it to it, attention to itself. And I do think that that probably disrupts some people's focus. For me, I've never had a problem with it, but I can see how maybe that would be something to improve. Uh, but either way, you have this baseline understanding of the music has to be ambient. Uh, music has to be, maybe not ambient, but it, it, it should not be attention grabbing in the sense that it's going to really be noisy and distract you from like focusing on the game, right? You shouldn't be like, you know, well, something that Reagan Burns told me in his conversation with me, he made the, he was uh, responsible for working on the N uh, series of platformers. So there's N, N plus and N plus plus. And these platformers, when he added electronic music that, that vibes really fast or whatever, he found that players were just really bad because they'd be vibing and they'd be wanting to go faster because of the music. And then they'd like miss and, and fail miserably and die or whatever. And that's actually kind of how I feel about it in the RTS context too. You want that more thoughtful pace, if, if that makes any sense from a, you know, we've all listened to music that's a little bit slower and it does feel a little bit more brooding or it feels like, oh yeah, we're thinking about something or, you know, we're musing on something like this is music that isn't going to distract me from my thoughts. That's the kind of music that you want. Even if it is going to be melodic and up-tempo the way that the Terran music is, it probably should be flowy and you know sort of doing its own thing off to the side and you can kind of take it or leave it or maybe you start vibing with it but ideally you aren't doing something uh too aggressive in that context you know i don't know exactly if there's probably not been studies about like yeah if terran players play with their music off they play five percent better or something like i don't think that's probably the case but like it could be you know that could be a thing so um as far as characteriza characterizing a faction you definitely want to choose your instruments well if you have a lot of factions like cm retails planned uh, you want to make sure that your instruments are highly unique. And then if there are similarities, those similarities are not, not incidental, right? Like, oh, we both use bass line, bass guitar and uh, drums in our, our OSTs or whatever, our soundtracks for the, these two factions. Like, that shouldn't be incidental. It should be that those two factions have something foundationally similar. And, you know, that's sort of what we get, right? So in the same way that, you know, the Terran... Uh, melee faction, right? The Orion Imperium in CMBW should have its music be echoed in all of the other sub-factions. Those sub-factions should also have a couple of changes to them or different instruments, like different primary instruments, perhaps, or maybe different secondary instruments that are like, you know, different. And you know, not just different for the sake of being different, but different in a way that encapsulates what they are different about. Like we should probably have something more crazy synth wavy or whatever for the futurist federation because you know you most people think of that kind of music and think oh yeah that's kind of in the future right cyberpunk type music or whatever um but again without being super distracting uh the other thing that you might consider is um when you are building up this idea of again there being foundational i like basically you want whatever you're trying to encompass and communicate with the music to be not just thematic in a raw sense of like, I start to associate the Terran music with the Terran faction, but whatever the music is, as far as its thematics go, should also reflect something about the the race, which is in the same way I was talking about the Protoss music being more on the ambient side. Well, Protoss are cool, calm, and collected for the most part, like our Protoss are at least. In StarCraft One's campaign, they're terrible and really dumb. But when you consider the idea of like, what, how does the race play out? Okay, that's something that, you know, we're having this slow march to battle. We're very kind of maybe somber about it, right? Uh, it actually fits the CMW Protoss a little bit better than it fits the default Protoss in terms of their gameplay specifically. 
and that, you know, maybe that's also just another way of thinking about it. Like we made Terran more Terran and Zerg more Zerg and Protoss more Protoss in terms of the gameplay. So maybe this just naturally reflects in their, in their music or whatever. Anyway, hopefully that was a good enough answer for that question. A classic like 20 minute question answer. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Luciferius asks, if you weren't fixing the RTS genre, what other genre would you tackle? So I thought about this when he asked it yesterday and I was thinking, I would be very tempted to work on an FPS. I mean, I plan an FPS, but I plan a lot of things. We'll see what happens. Um, however, uh, at the same time, I also started falling in love with the concept of roguelike or roguelite games, where you have this, you know, proc gen, as they call it, right? Procedural generation of a lot of different things, um, levels or gear or whatever. And I feel like it's possible to make those games actually good without fucking the player up with RNG. Like instead of the game deciding the fate of your run, it's still the skill deciding the fate of the run, but you're also testing as part of a big skill, you're testing adaptability. And so it's, um, Veek has described this as input RNG versus output RNG. I have not looked up those terms to see if they're, if they're actually accurate or whatever. I sort of just trust him on that. Uh, input RNG being, here's the environment. Like input RNG is randomized spawns in Cosmonarchy Brood War when you play 1v1 or something. You know what I mean? Like I'm in the top left and I used, I was in the bottom right last time or a four player spawn. The top right and the top left are empty. We're on the bottom, like something like that, right? Um, that's input RNG, right? It's, it's not changing anything about your actions, but it's it changing the environment in which your actions begin to take shape. Output RNG is you missed because you were attacking from the low ground and there's a coin flip as to whether or not you hit. That's obviously much worse, um, pretty much no matter how you slice it. So instead, you would want certain things to be randomized basically on the beginning of the game, like the environment, the levels, etc. You would want that randomization to also not be too dumb in the sense that it's just naive and you walk into an area, like a really extreme example of this would be if you randomize a layout, a level layout, and it's not even connected and you can't get to the other side of the level or something, that would be really bad. So yeah, I think the more I think about it, I'd probably tackle roguelites where you have this progression and you have this like interesting idea and you control like one character. Probably I could see it being something like Hades in terms of the angle or Diablo or whatever in terms of the, the camera angle. Um, but it would, it would probably be very different in many ways. I, I would be really gunning for the idea that for one, I would stress co-op. For another, I would stress the idea that like if there is going to be some sort of progression, obviously if you're having co-op involved, you wouldn't want it to be like based on the player power. It would be maybe more about like you could influence the randomization somehow by, you know, the plan for Onatar is when you're starting a run, uh, you have these premonition slots where you can foresee what kinds of mutations or, or what have you, the, um, the pretenses, right? What kind of pretenses will actually be there? And I think that's really cool because it basically lets you lock in a play style if you want to or try something specific. And then, you know, that would also leave the opportunity available for like, maybe there's like a, a game of the week mode or something that, hey, uh, this, you know, you've got the pretense system here and we, we lock in some of them via a custom premonition set. And that's like the mutation mode or whatever in StarCraft II co-op or something, I guess. I don't know. Something like that, right? Where, you know, you, you can play this challenge run and we organize those. It wouldn't be randomly generated. We would organize which ones we think are interesting. So we have like a, a custom seed of a level that we think is actually particularly challenging and you've got like a week to complete it or something. That, that kind of opens the door for something like that. So yeah, I think it would probably be roguelites. Uh, it could also be FPSs. Obviously I got a lot of ideas for all that stuff. That's why we're going to make some if everything goes to my plan. Heltris, Heltrix, Heltrix asks, will you ever consider a larger company buying out CM Retail in the future? Uh, first of all, welcome, Heltrix. This is your first time qu asking a question, even though you've been giving us money for a good while now. Thanks for that, homie. Um, would I consider a larger company buying out CM Retail in the future? I mean, in many ways, it represents a ton of my ideas and life's work, etc. Like, some of the ideas for the races, the regencies there, are like Mackerel Das and Keltar. I've, and even Ansifi, I've had for like over a decade. So it would suck a lot to have that taken away from me legally on illegal terms. And then like, you know, that, that would be pretty bad. Um, I would no longer necessarily be able to, you know, pursue trying to build those out. Uh, with 20 Regencies, I mean, this is a pure hypothetical question because I don't think anybody would ever do it. Uh, so I guess the answer would have to be, 
yeah, this this has to be like a lot. You've got to be giving me a lot of money. And ideally, you know, keeping me on as advisor for like making sure that you don't fuck up the project too much, uh, which I'm sure they would do anyway. But beyond all of that, you also have to think, okay, if this is going to facilitate the production of additional work in the future, like if this lets me coast for a good while because of this buyout, I can invest that money and time into building something like Onatar uh, and maybe pursuing something different that still ends up being the same level of scale as CM Retail. It's not like my, all of my ideas went into to, to Zabalba, right? They would probably be buying out Zabalba as, a, as an idea because that's where all the regencies come from. By the way, I do deliberately mispronounce it or whatever. I call it Zabalba instead of Shibalba. For people who are wondering, there was some confusion when I was doing the initial dev streams on that way back. I figured I might as well clarify. Um, would I ever consider a larger company buying it? I mean, I would. Like, it would have to be a lot of money. I would have to have some creative control or at least oversight to, like, answer questions and help them out or whatever. Um, ideally. Like, the, again, a hypoth pure hypothetical, right? Because nobody's ever going to do that. But if they did, uh, that's probably how it would go. And, again, I have so many other ideas that... I can come up with another magnum opus if I get a couple months or a month or whatever to, to start doing the conceptual process. So even though it is very clearly like the one that I've put the most conceptual progress in uh, or conceptual work amount into it, and a lot of those ideas are really old, they're my ideas. If somebody buys them out and then fucks them up, like that's because they weren't their ideas. So they didn't understand them. And so they didn't succeed where I would have theoretically succeeded. So I don't think it's too much of a concern that I would get outcompeted or whatever. Um, the reason why I publicate all of my ideas is because if you don't fully understand why I arrived at those ideas and you don't understand the merits of those ideas, and maybe those ideas aren't even fully mature anyway, so I would come up with a better idea that's a riff on that idea later on when starting to work on them. I publicate them all because I don't believe somebody can just take the, way, the idea away from me and then do a better job. Like, it's not just the idea, it's the execution. So I'm not super worried about that. Um, if something like that did happen, like I've thought about this before too. It's like, if, you know, Blizzard hired me, like when I was making in consummate and, and Hydra and stuff, people were saying like, Oh, what if Blizzard hired you? Like, well, they, that would never happen. Cause I'm like a vocally outspoken critic of how they're terrible. And also come on, dude, I don't want my breast milk stolen. But beyond that, like, even if that did happen and I was not thus like not allowed to work on mods anymore or whatever, because, um, or, or something like that, where, like, they take the rights of, like, the inconsummate characters was, like, that was a serious question somebody asked me. It's like, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, buddy. But even beyond all of that, it's like, okay, that's, if, if I entertain that premise as an idea, like, so what? I've got so many other things that I can do. I've got so many other ideas. I've got so many other stories I want to tell. So many other games I want to make. Like, I will not be able to make all the games I want to make before the end of this fucking universe, bros. It's not going to happen. So, uh... I'm not concerned about that. If somebody wants to take that idea and go with it, well, hearts off, you know, hats off to them and, and my heart goes out to them for when they inevitably probably don't do a good enough job because it's my idea and not theirs. And, you know, I got plenty more. So I'm not, not worried. If they fail with my idea, I can actually do the better job with my idea anyway. And if they actually legally buy out my idea for whatever reason or somehow, well, I have so many other ideas I can pivot to, you know? So like, I, I, I can't lose basically. I'm always winning. Moving on to Three Crow's question. Yeah, that's Kian. But Three Crow, dude, come on. On the topic of tutorials, a three-part tutorial proposal. Part one, the hyper-aggressive 1v1 that I already plan and have planned for some time. Part two, a 2v2 with the ally being at a disadvantage, which is a little bit different than my 2v2 plan that I already had, but something worth noting. And part three, a two versus three with rush, timing, and greed AI opponents with an AI ally being either random or just timing for stability. This would allow players to basically teach uh, themselves how to deal with uh, an overwhelming enemy force. You know, presumably this would imagine that the AI is still you know, not able to close games because otherwise this would be very un unwinnable. Um, and then of course, there's also the potential for AI arriving mid game as maybe a, a part four or just something that happens within part three where the game scales up over time. Uh, and either one of those could be pretty interesting to think about. We were talking about tutorials. This is actually a question or a series of questions that he had proposed a while ago, like maybe a week or two ago, and I hadn't gotten to them because I, well, it was just a big topic or whatever. Um, tutorials, we, we've already discussed a little bit in general about how the, the tutorials are really just bad in video games. Uh, they don't usually train you up with anything. Since this conversation, I started a tutorial for Terran in a 1v1 with the hyper-aggressive option being a thing. 
And that map, the layout for that map is done. The There needs to be some custom tiles still, I think, but uh, and some decoration in general. Uh, but the layout is finished. The uh, AI obviously needs to be done. The script needs to be done. But that could be the first part here already. And with the idea of the, the question part of this proposal is basically like, would this make sense within the context of trying to teach somebody how to play an RTS uh, or how to play our vision of an RTS? And also, you know, is there more to do? Is there anything to, to critique here? I think the one thing I would say is that part two, having the two versus two, if the ally is at a disadvantage, it is it is forcing players to play well. But if the if the AI ally can be stabilized in some way, that can be something where you can then transition to a more like let them carry the game kind of approach if you, you know, support them well enough. And that would still be proactive play and still be heads up play. So I would want to have like both of those be possibilities. That being said, I like the idea that if the, if the first tutorial mission you play is a 1v1, then you're already being forced to be self-sufficient and defeat the enemy. In the case of the second part of the tutorial or second mission in a tutorial campaign or something being 2v2, suddenly the ally being at a disadvantage doesn't matter as much because then you get the access to the, uh, you know, the, the AI ally will eventually help you out or will generally help you out absorb pressure for you. But you've already been blooded in the sense of being able to defeat an AI opponent. So this really shouldn't be a huge issue for you. In the case of part three with, uh, you know, the two versus three, the lopsided thing, I actually think I would prefer to do the arriving mid game part, but I definitely like the idea of, you know, rush timing, greed, etc. Really, you could, you could skin this cat multiple ways. You could do a series of one versus one tutorials where the first one is hyper aggressive. Then the second one is more about timing uh, or, you know, well-rounded strategies or something, maybe a variety of them. And then the third one is actually about um, being greedy, locking down the terrain. So you get like a, a sort of amuse-bouche of, of options there, right? Like you get a, a series, a variety of, of one versus one skirmishes that teach you about different play styles that are actually possible within the game, uh, all within, you know, presumably fighting the same race. But you could even divvy it up there as well. Maybe the enemy is random and you... So that, that would probably be more of like an arcade style thing as opposed to a more grounded narrative. But you could maybe work that in too. Um, the other way that you could, of course, do it is this more organized fashion where you go from 1v1 to 2v2 to some sort of lopsided or mid-game arrival thing. Um, that could definitely work out quite well. And I'm sure it will please 3 Crow and others listening to know that I have indeed started on a tutorial in that sense. So hopefully we're able to get some people up to snuff. I think for a Terran tutorial campaign, having this exact method should be initially like fine. The thing that's being proposed by three crow, obviously with some adjustments here and there or some, you know, caveats, perhaps some uh, knowledges that, you know, something might work out a little bit awkwardly or something. And then we could maybe adapt or see what worked with that and like change that for Zerg and for Protoss having a uh, mini like three part tutorial campaign for each race, I think would go a long way to initiating new players into the series, uh, into the mod, and then allowing them to maybe feel a little bit better about attacking, uh, you know, the, the cooperative or competitive edge stuff that they want to do. So that's kind of interesting to think about. And for sure, I'm excited to uh, put some of those ideas into practice, of course. It's just that I've been focusing pretty heavily on this macro revision for Protoss, as well as the Ascension tournaments and etc. Uh, so, of course, I haven't done too much on the content side of things because I've also been trying to, like, improve audiovisuals and do some bug fixes and all this other stuff. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Alexander is rounding us out with a final question. What is your ideal version of CMBW? How many races, factions, campaigns? And would you include the uh, increase the player limit and things like that? Well, this is a doozy of a question because uh, Cosmonarchy Brood War is very prototypical, right? Uh, no pun intended with the name of this podcast, but we are trying to prototype our ideas and think about how we are going to, you know, approach a more, I, like we're experimenting a lot here and we're going to see what works and what doesn't. And it makes sense to make campaigns just like it makes sense to run to, to tournaments and do all this other stuff. It makes sense to do all these extra things because it gives us good data on what could be different or what could be better or what of our ideas worked, what are, which of our ideas survive and didn't survive the test of competitive uh, attention, so to speak, as well as generally like having playtime by other players uh, irregardless. So I would say when we're thinking about the ideal version of CMBW, if I was going to take the approach where it wasn't being 
just this prototype for all of our ideas, this testing ground for all of our ideas. I do eventually want to move on and, and obviously make my own games like Onatar and et cetera, Pangea, et cetera. But the idea for how many races, factions, et cetera, I mean, I, I think the faction list is probably fairly robust right now. The only reason why there's that many is that those are what are required for the setting. Uh, maybe we would add one or two more for like Protoss or Zerg or something. Uh, I'm, I don't think that would be a, a huge issue, but it's not something that I want to include in Melee anyway, so it doesn't really matter if there's like a unique, like a, a parity number or whatever, right? Where there's always the same number of uh, factions for each race or what have you. As far as campaigns go, I plan three distinct campaigns, not including the tutorials. So I guess ideally all of those would be done. Uh, maybe there would be more along the way. I never really considered or conceptualized an end number. And would I, of course, be adding more races? Well, we already know the answer to that is yes, but I'd prefer to finish this Protoss revision before even thinking about that. And in order to add more races, we do need to, of course, um, extend iScript. So that's our first order of business. And then we have to figure out how AI are going to work with that, which is our second order of business. Like both of those are really big tasks. Uh, X405 is back and working on the iScript thing alongside some other utilities like campaign uh, enhancements and u main menus and stuff. So you know, there's there's definitely going to be ideals uh, that we can strive towards as to whether or not we'll actually achieve that. I'm not sure. And yes, the player limit would definitely benefit from being increased. Um, I don't think you can even argue with that. It's just that might be like if you had to pick between extending the player limit and extending the graphical design such that we have. Um, what would you even say? like more uh, like full color RGB with no palette restrictions or like widescreen support or whatever. Like they're probably both equally difficult to do and they're both really hard to do. So it's not just like, oh, you know, this is like a month of work, which is already pretty high. It, it's apparently, I've been told that the graphic side of things at least is like three months of work, even if you know what you're doing. I don't know how true that is, but it was told to me by Nave, who I would ideally be able to trust with some of the, statements that he makes regarding technicalities maybe there's stuff that i'm not sure of or aware of i know farty uh who is a developer in the community or not in our community but just in general in the starcraft community who has worked on a lot of things like he's the reason why we have dat ext which allows us to have infinite unit ids or whatever uh among other things he's responsible for some utilities that can allow like full transparency on graphics it's just since it's software rendering it's actually really inefficient. So you would get massive slowdowns on big numbers of units, uh, as you might imagine. So, or big numbers of graphics drawn in general. So we can't really do that. But yeah, an ideal version would definitely look like something like that, where we get a lot of different variety in that sense. So uh, having a lot more of everything would be nice. Uh, but, you know, baby steps. Let's balance the races we have. Let's finish the revisions we're already thinking about. Let's finish what's on our plate. And then we'll think about adding more stuff to our plate and eating again. And, you know, why not eat just a bunch of Mickin, just like Ahmed? And that's it. That's the end of uh, Prototype Episode 15. Talked about the Protoss revision to that macro model, or however you want to come up with a term for that. Uh, dedication of pylons, of workers into pylons, of pylons into better pylons. Uh, auras, uh, different ways to you know train structures or, or warp in structures and upgrade augment structures. All this other cool stuff. It's going to happen. We have uh, already begun the work. So let's make AI work on it. And then let's uh, see if we can't make Protoss great again. Homies, see you guys soon. And thanks for all the questions.